So then we get to the final stretch of the muscle shoals, the one that's here in front of Florence, the little muscle shoals. Um, this is a stretch of 5.3 miles from Bainbridge to the Florence Bridge and Steamboat Landing, which was the head of navigation. Now, as we'll see in a moment, it was not always possible to get a steamboat up to the Florence Landing, but it was the furthest point upriver that you could practically reach about six and a half months out of the year. Um, so uh, Jackson Island and Patton Island are the most significant river features in the entire stretch of the Muscle Shoals. They're both approximately uh, two and two thirds miles long. Um, on the top over here is a beautiful pencil engraving done by one Adolf Metzer, who was here with the Army of the Ohio in the summer of 1862. He is depicting the ruined railroad bridge here at Florence. It's the earliest depiction that I've ever found of the railroad bridge at Florence. This was after Confederate forces under General Beauregard had destroyed the bridge after the Battle of Shiloh. Um, and then this depiction over here on the right of improvements done in the mid 20th century by the TVA um, to improve river navigation at the Florence Canal. Um, the old canal you'll see in the top image, um, it approached the railroad bridge at a very awkward angle. And at this time it was not the lifting span, but it was actually one that pivoted. And so the barges would have to execute a very difficult maneuver to be able to clear that bridge. And what they did is they dug a new canal, which is the current Florence Canal, and replaced the railroad bridge with a lifting span, which is obviously not there in, anymore today. I did also do my best to indicate the future site of Wilson Dam, which uh, crosses over the foot of Jackson Island. I actually, I belabored putting that line there. I, re, uh, I looked at the angle, I looked at the topography with a magnifying glass. That's the best that I can do for you folks, but that's about where Wilson Dam is today. Um, and then also a curiosity, across the river bridge on the south bank of the Tennessee River was a post office and a settlement called South Florence. Um, Lee said that I should mention something about South Florence. So this is a 1907 map that indicates the settlement of South Florence, which was just where you crossed the railroad bridge. Um, the railroad bridge, I'll say a word as well, uh, a very frightening structure if you ask me. Uh, so cars and wagons would go across the bottom and locomotives would go across the top overhead. One direction of traffic, by the way, and it wasn't necessarily always safe. In the 1890s, there was a major issue whenever a locomotive crashed through the superstructure of the bridge and down into the Tennessee River. Uh, citizens had been complaining about it to the Memphis and Charleston for years, apparently, and they didn't do anything about it until a train crashed through the bridge, of course. Yeah, so, you know, going across that bridge, oh, it's, it's remarkable it's still there. Yeah, the Memphis people. Yeah, anyway, but so very frightening, the bridge at Florence. Um, definitely not the leisurely afternoon stroll that people like to take on it these days. Um, now, no discussion of the shoals would really be complete without talking about the Colbert Shoals or also the Bee Tree Shoals. Um, now, they're not part of the Muscle Shoals, but they are a significant enough obstruction to navigation um, that they precluded river navigation in some months of the year um, whenever Riverton, also called Chickasaw, was the head of navigation along with Waterloo. There was a canal that was built here um, between 1891 and 1911, which is rather unfortunate. It ended up being moot because the Tennessee Valley Authority came along 20 years later and flooded it all. Um, I'm actually running low on time, so I'm not going to go so deep into that. Uh, basically, just talking about how in 4.2 uh, miles at Colbert Shoal, there was a fall of 14 and a half feet, which works out to about 3.15 feet per mile. So not as precipitous as the, uh, as the big muscle shoals, but definitely an obstruction to navigation in low water. Um, William Tecumseh Sherman whenever he crossed the Tennessee River at Waterloo in October 1863, says, I was down to Eastport yesterday, and we went up to Colbert Shoals and grounded in less than four feet. No boat at yet can reach Florence. So he says that he tries to get a boat up over Colbert Shoals to reach Florence, but the boat grounded in less than four feet of water, and they were unable to reach it. So to give you an idea, I mean, we're talking about the Tennessee River being less than four feet deep, where a steamboat can't get over it. And this is at Colbert Shoals. And then also to talk about Bear Creek, because its geography has been heavily impacted by the TVA. This is the 1916 topographic map of Bear Creek, and then what the same stretch of creek looks like today. It's 
virtually inundated. Um, there are still a few um, recognizable features of the landform which I've drawn the line to, including this uh, railroad trestle. You can clearly see sort of this elbow that it makes here as it uh, uh, climbs up the elevation close to the Mississippi state line. I have another quotation from William Tecumseh Sherman because he's fascinating to me, talking about the trestle work at Bear Creek. Um, it consisted of two spans of 110 feet each, uh, which were burned and fell into the river. They're destroying the bridge, if you, if you didn't catch that. Um, with axes and fire, he destroyed three pieces of trestle work an aggregate length of 500 feet. He also gives a shout out to the Florence Bridge. At Florence, there's a very fine bridge for a branch railroad that connects Florence with Tuscumbia with a road bridge underneath. But it was the unanimous opinion of all the pilots that the gunboats and even one of the transports could not pass Bee Tree Shoals or Colbert Shoals, both rock bottom. So he's not able to destroy the railroad bridge at Florence, which was his mission given to him by Ulysses S. Grant. But it didn't matter anyway, because Beauregard's pretty much already burned the bridge by this point anyway. This is April 14th, 1862, one week to the day after the second battle, or the second day of the Battle of Shiloh. In the next and final part of this uh, presentation, we're going to talk a bit about the human interaction with the shoals, which, as I said, ultimately led to the disappearance of the shoals altogether. Now, the shoals were home to Native American groups starting in the Paleo-Indian period, uh, starting about 15,000 years ago. And according to the Muscle Shoals National Heritage Area, the oldest sites of human habitation in the southeast are in the Tennessee Valley region. Uh, the Paleo-Indians were uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers. They used temporary rock shelters. Um, there is evidence that they foraged mussels out of the Tennessee River, which was very bountiful, of course, with um, shellfish. They had a very symbiotic relationship with the river, um, meaning they didn't seek really to tamper with its geog geology or ecology. They just harnessed it for their benefit. Um, and evidence for he heavy gathering of mussels during the Archaic period um, is it produced shell mounds over 15 feet deep. So Indians most definitely made good use of the bountiful resources that were here. Um, by the woodland period, which is about 2,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago, um, settlements became permanent in this area. And by the Mississippian period, which carries us up to the time of first European contact, the Muscle Shoals region was home to flourishing permanent communities of Native Americans. There were some on Cogers Island, on Patton's Island. Um, they had burial mounds. They've left behind um, beautifully ornate uh, trinkets and, and ornamentations. Um, they led a, a permanent existence. I will say as well, the Indian Mound dates from the Woodland period, which is uh, quite a bit older than the Mississippian period. Um, when first uh, European Americans first began settling in this area, uh, finding a way over the shoals very quickly became uh, a problem to solve um, because, of course, boats at this time are the most efficient means of transporting goods over large distances because, I mean, the river does a lot of the work for you, especially if you're going downstream. And the, especially the goods of, of cotton. Um, from the beginning of European settlement in North Alabama, starting in about 1806 at Huntsville, cotton crops and cotton speculation were already the dominant cash crop in this area. The natural choice of market for those goods was New Orleans. Um, you could put your cotton on a keelboat, float it down the Tennessee River all the way to New Orleans where it could be sold on the world market. The keelboat men would then break up their boats, sell the wood for whatever they could get for it, and then travel back on foot over land, often by way of the Natchez Trace. The Tennessee River at the Muscle Shoals, however, pre presented a huge problem. Some of the things that we've talked about already, the river wasn't reliable enough to make commerce uh, congenial, to make it profitable, because the fluctuation of the water levels was so unpredictable and extreme. You might put your cotton on a boat in Huntsville at Ditto's Landing and find that there wasn't enough water in the shoals for you to get your boat over. You would have a choice of taking the cotton off, putting it on a wagon and hauling it around the shoals, which was laborious and expensive, or you could wait for the water to rise, which might take who knows how long. And all the time you're losing money on your cotton crop. Um, and it essentially severed the Tennessee River in half in a section from Florence down to Paducah and an upper section that includes Chattanooga, Knoxville, and a huge region in East Tennessee. Now, 
the advent of steamboats changes this somewhat. Um, it was really exciting for me and curious to realize that steamboat navigation on the Tennessee River is almost as old as the city of Florence itself. The first recorded uh, venture of a steamboat to Florence happened in the end of the year 1821. And by the start of the year 1822, there was regular steamboat service from New Orleans to Florence. Um, now, with the advent of steamboats, they actually, there are some isolated instances of steamboats managing to get up over the shoals, but the um, enormous force of the rushing water, these steamboats just didn't have enough force to overcome that. And they would do like in the old days and do what they call bushwhacking, which is where they tie a rope onto the shrubs on the side of the riverbank and the men pull the boat along until they get to the next shrub and then they, they do this kind of a lassoing maneuver. Um, and very soon after Alabama became a state, people were already proposing solutions to this problem. Now, and I'm not a political science major by any means, but at this point in time, it was generally agreed that Congress did not have the authority to regulate commerce on the rivers, interstate commerce. That was something that was left to the states. And so if the people of Muscle Shoals wanted a canal around their river, well, that was up to the people of Muscle Shoals to make it happen with funding. Um, John C. Calhoun, who was then Secretary of War in 1827, delivered a message to Congress, which one of the big three items for spending he outlined was a canal improvement project at Muscle Shoals. So very slowly, um, the mindset began to shift that maybe it was the federal government's responsibility, at least to help shoulder some of the cost. And very early on, the federal government seems to have paid for some surveys to be done for a canal at Muscle Shoals. Um, those surveys date from about 1828 to 1830. And by 1830, they had actually broken ground on a canal at Muscle Shoals, the first Muscle Shoals Canal. Um, this canal was plagued with problems from the very beginning. For one thing, they only uh, focused on the big muscle shoals. So they left out Elk River Shoals, they left out Little Muscle Shoals. Um, they also didn't build uh, viaducts across the mouth of the streams that flowed into the canal. So whenever it rained heavily, sediment would pile into the canal and debris like trees and things like that. And the consequence was the fact that the canal really only was in operation for four or five years before being completely abandoned by about 1840. Coincidentally, at this time, the oldest railroad in the western part of the United States, which is south of the Ohio and west of the Appalachians, is constructed at Tuscumbia, um, from their river landing to the city of Tuscumbia proper. And eventually, it's extended on to Decatur by 1834. And this practically eliminates a lot of the need for a canal at Muscle Shoals. Um, but it's still a laborious process to take your goods off of a boat, put them onto a railroad wagon, and then take them to Tuscumbia, where you put them back on a boat. Um, this railroad, the Tuscumbia, Cortland, and Decatur, will eventually be uh, fused into the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, which was the most significant railroad in the antebellum, um, in the antebellum South, and eventually in the Confederacy, the only one that connected the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, curiously enough, both the railroad and the river are going to play a huge role as a channel of deportation for Native Americans during the uh, Trail of Tears. And it's very sadly ironic indeed that the Cherokee who gave the Tennessee River its name in our tongue are ultimately deported to Oklahoma by means of the Tennessee River. Um, steamboat traffic in general, continued to prosper, especially throughout the first half of the 19th century. Um, both the river and the railroad, the Memphis and Charleston, played a huge role in the coming American Civil War. And that was a huge realization that I had early on. In fact, the Memphis and Charleston Railroad arguably had every reason for bringing on the Battle of Shiloh where and when it did. Now, the Tennessee River was penetrated by Union gunboats very early in the war. The war was not even a year old yet in February 1862 when federal forces under General Halleck take Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and federal gunboats actually make landfall in Florence three days later. It is, to my reckoning, the first moment that Union boots actually set foot on occupied Alabama or uh, seceded Alabama during the Civil War. So it's the first moment of occupation of Alabama during the Civil War right here at Florence because of the Tennessee River. 
After the war, the problem of river commerce and navigation at the Shoals returned to the forefront. In March 1871, Congress gave an appropriation for some money for a new survey for another canal, which was begun in 1875 under direction of the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, by 1890, that canal was functional. And you'll see an image here from America's Gibraltar on uh, the lower uh, left-hand side. The canal was dug out along the north side of the river, so you see these escarpments, these limestone bluffs on one end. The river, the Wild River, is here on the right, and there is a towpath. Uh, a railroad line ran along the side to help tow steamboats through the canal, especially going upstream. Um, and that's just where they, they, they excavated and threw the rubbish on the side, and that became the towpath between the canal and the river. Uh, it's ironic, though, that uh, the efforts of the Army Corps of Engineers are ultimately going to be short-lived. The canal is completed in 1890, and by 1916, 26 years later, after a century of stunted development, we get the appro approval of Wilson Dam, which is going to take care of the entire problem. Um, a few eyewitness reports of what the Shoals was like at this time. Um, the Donaldson Expedition is a really famous one. Um, John Donaldson led a group of settlers from the Watauga settlements in East Tennessee down the Tennessee River to ultimately settle what would become Nashville. This was in uh, December 18, uh, 1779, before the United States has even gained independence from Great Britain. Um, and they passed through the Shoals in March 1780. Um, he says, after trimming our boats in the best manner possible, we ran through the shoals before night. When we approached them, they had a dreadful appearance to those who had never seen them before. The water being high made a terrible roaring, which could be heard at some distance. Among the driftwood heaped frightfully upon the points of the islands, the current running in every possible direction. Here we did not know how soon we should be dashed to pieces, and all our troubles ended at once. Our boats frequently dragged on the bottom and appeared constantly in danger of striking. They warped as much as in a rough sea. But by the hand of providence, we are now preserved from this danger also. I know not the length of this wonderful shoal. It had been represented to me to be 25 or 30 miles. If so, we must have descended very rapidly, as indeed we did, for we passed it in about three hours. That's Colonel John Donaldson, who, by the way, is the father-in-law of future President Andrew Jackson. Um, this is General Owen Mitchell. He is the one who captured Huntsville uh, early in April 1862, the first Union commander to occupy the Tennessee River Valley. Um, he mentions uh, capturing Bainbridge Ferry, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to read his quotation. I have some wonderful photographs here that were printed in, um, what is it, uh, the, the life, uh, Muscle Shoals Canal, Life of the Canalers, um, which shows these images of the locks on the Muscle Shoals system. Um, there are the captions here. The one on the bottom left is the Shoal Creek Aqueduct when empty. And um, the Shoal Creek Aqueduct, so the canal, whenever it crossed a major stream like Shoal Creek, to keep from being inundated with sediment whenever the water was high, the engineers just built a bridge for the canal across the mouth of Shoal Creek. And it was really a technological marvel in its day. It was really no, uh, no small feat. Um, yeah, uh, over Shoal Creek, this is according to Joshua Wynn, who wrote the book. Over Shoal Creek, which brought the greatest volume of water into the canal, the engineers designed and constructed an aqueduct. Measuring 900 feet long and 60 feet wide, the aqueduct was indeed a feat of engineering. And whenever we remember that we're in the 19th century, it most definitely is. It would be difficult to construct even in modern times. This is where the Muscle Shoals Canal crossed over Blue Water Creek on the bottom right hand. Um, the railroad is carried over by a small bridge, and there is also a low-level dam right here that keeps the water level high enough for boats to be able to traverse whenever they come out of the lock. Now, um, the Muscle Shoals Canal was not really a great success. After all of the work that the Army Corps of Engineers put into it over the course of 15 years, um, maintenance of the canal was made difficult by the fact that 15 streams emptied directly into it. The number of passengers carried on steamboats through the canal dropped to almost nothing between 1907 and 1912. Now, part of the reason for this is growing competition from the railroads. Um, railroad network in the eastern United States had become so extensive and reliable and cheap that they really gave the canal boats a run for their money, and it was a lot faster and easier and more reliable to travel by train. Um, it, they still continued to carry freight, but ultimately 
Oh, and these are some, some beautiful images. Uh, a steamboat going across the viaduct there at Shoal Creek. Amazing to see a steamboat going across a bridge, but that's the way that it worked. <laughs> um, that's the city of Charleston in 1905. And then, of course, the famous image from the railroad bridge at Florence, uh, circa 1890, of a uh, locomotive going across the top of the bridge there. That's the General John Coffey at the Florence Landing. You may can recognize the railroad bridge in the background. Now, with the approval in 1916 of an appropriation of Congress uh, for the production of hydroelectricity to make fertilizer out to nitrate plants here at the Shoals, the construction of Wilson Dam began. Uh, this is a postcard that is available on the library's digital archives website from 1921 showing Wilson Dam a mammoth undertaking at the time um, currently under construction. And then after the completion of the dam in 1926, uh, the big mussel shoals are all but inundated and most of the mussel shoals canal with it. Um, the story really takes off and we reach the cusp of modernity with the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1933. And this is the Tennessee Valley system. Uh, it shows how precipitate the river drops. This section right here, right between 200 and 300 where it dips down so steeply represents the section between Wilson and Wheeler Dam. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, wrap up here in case anyone has any questions. This is virtually the end. Whenever we reach the story of the TVA, that's where we say goodbye to the Muscle Shoals that had existed in North Alabama for eons from the beginning of time up until less than 100 years ago with ultimately the creation of uh, Wheeler Dam in 1933, which flooded the rest of the Elk River Shoals, and Pickwick Dam in 1935, which flooded the Colbert Shoals. Um, after 37, whenever the pool of Pickwick had uh, filled to its maximum level, there is no trace of the shoals. Um, and I actually, I gave this program to a group of uh, five to 12 year olds over the summer for summer reading and I created this graphic here on the right which illustrates the difference between the wild river uh, of centuries ago and the tamed river that we see today. Um, the wild river of the Tennessee where there are no man-made, where there are no man-made obstacles with the shallow water, the rushing water over reefs and islands with the abundant wildlife, um, with the towering bluffs created over centuries and centuries of erosion are virtually gone now. We, we have a system of dams and locks that generate hydroelectricity, but the important thing to note is that all of those features are still there. They're still under the surface and if the dams disappeared tomorrow, they would reemerge. Now, of course, the human intervention at the Shoals hasn't only changed the geography of the area, but it's changed the ecology of the area as well. And this is actually just a small sample of the various species of mussels that once were plentiful in the Mussel Shoals region of the Tennessee Valley, but now have either been extinct or extirpated from the area. Um, they have the most charming little names. There's on the left here, the Cumberland Bean, um, the little wing pearly mussel in the middle, which apparently was historically found in Blue Water Creek in abundance. And then um, the fluted kidney shell over here on the bottom right, all of which are no longer found um, in this area. They were particularly adapted to live in the reefs and the shallows of fast moving water over the shoals. And whenever they were inundated by the dams, they, they lost their habitat. And then it's important for us to realize then, of course, that while we may bend nature to serve our wishes, sometimes that has unintended consequences for the other creatures that call this planet and this river home. And finally, for a comparison, I have the 1885 Army Corps of Engineers map with a, a screenshot, excuse me, a screenshot from Google Maps of the same stretch of water today. Just as a, as a contrast, I've drawn lines between fixed points of reference so that you can sort of orient yourself. Um, downstream, we have the foot of Patton Island, the mouth of Blue Water Creek just below where they built Wheeler Dam, and the confluence of Elk River with the Tennessee River. If you know where to look though, you can still see these features. Uh, navigation charts from the mid 20th century, um, you can barely make out the hashed lines here. They still show these submerged river features. Um, in blue on the right hand side of the, stre the screen, that indicates areas of very shallow water. You can actually see Cox's Island up here, uh, Tick Island along the south bank, and then the shallows as well south of Wheeler. The important thing to know is that the shoals may be underwater now, yes. 
but their legacy lives on in many ways. They live on in the name of our community, in the river heritage, which has made this a unique place to live and ultimately drew our ancestors to this area and makes it even today a culturally rich and unique place to live. Well, thank you so much for your attention. You've all been very kind. Um, we have a few minutes, I think. If, if anyone has any questions, I will do my best to answer them. I did a lot of reading on this. You may be able to recognize from the word vomit coming at you. I've read a lot on the subject. Kitty, do you have a question? Well, I had three, and I don't think one of them. Can you pick up one? <laughs> yeah, but that Donaldson party. Yes. They stopped in Nashville, and they were part of the early settlers of Nashville. That's correct. It's and called French boys, Lick. The old boy's ancestor was on that boat, which is Victor. Really? Yeah, That's wonderful. They had a heck of a time. Yeah, um, they really did. The journey, they left uh, what is now the Knoxville area in December, I believe, of 1779. They <laughs> didn't reach Nashville until April. So they spent four months on the Tennessee River. Um, whenever they got to Muscle Shoals, they were expecting that there was going to be a sign from a man who had come overland to Nashville to blaze a trail for them because the Muscle Shoals was such a fearful obstacle. And he was supposed to mark on a tree a certain sign if he had been able to blaze the trail for them. They looked, they couldn't find the sign on the tree, so they thought, well, we've got to run the shoals. It was definitely not their first course of action. The Cherokees, especially the lower Chickamauga Cherokees near what is now Chattanooga, harassed them as well, fire Firing uh, arrows and, and muskets as them as they pass by what is now Chattanooga. Um, they had a heck of a time. Uh, Nashville at that time was called French Lick. Um, I personally prefer Nashville. I think it has a nicer ring to it. Uh, all right.